started. Uh, God has a way of making things all things right, so we're going to start where we are and with who's here. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hello. For those of you don't know who don't know who I am, just about everybody here does probably. I'm Clayton Washington, uh, the president of the Kennard Alumni Association, and I'm so glad to be here today. And thank you guys for coming to help us celebrate uh, the dedication of the great, great old building that sits next to you. Um, recently, I became a grandpa for the first time. Uh, my middle daughter decided to become a foster parent. And she adopted a little boy that's now 11 months old, a little girl that's 28 months old. And every day when I go in to see him, or when I wake, wake him in the morning, or I go in the room when he's in there, I do like this, yay! And his little hands go up and he says, yay! Okay? So I'm gonna ask you guys to give me a yay moment this morning. Yay! Yay! Uh, whenever I come, uh, we feel the sharing of dedication of Kenner High School and its conversion to the African American History uh, Museum. And as we celebrate today, just know that we thank you for being a part of getting us to where we are. Uh, we have pledged to make this dream a reality for all citizens of Queen Anne's County, especially our young people, who we want to recognize and understand where we came from. Uh, I, at this point in time, uh, it's not going to be a long welcome. Uh, if there are any board members from Kennard here, I'd like you to stand up just for a moment to acknowledge you. In the brochure, I mean, in your program, there are their names. But I'm looking at John Wright, Mr. Nesbitt, Janet Pauls, Melvin Shorter, uh, Eleanor Brown, and where's Miss Hollis? Oh, there she is. She's moved over. It was Madeline Hollis. Uh, and together, we thank you all for being here today. So, with that, welcome. And now I'm going to introduce our mistress of ceremonies. Um, been, what, two years? the second year? For the second year. For the second year. Coming back to the year, the year we're now is her second year here with us. Uh, we're so happy and so proud to have with us today Dr. Andrea Kane. Uh, Dr. Kane is the superintendent of Queen Anne's County Public Schools, and we're just thrilled to have her here and to be a part of this program today. So, Dr. Kane. Thank you very much, Mr. Washington. It is indeed a pleasure. Uh, folks have been thanking me this morning, but I'd just like to say to you, it's my pleasure, I mean, my distinct honor to be here this morning. This is a momentous occasion, and I'm just blessed to be a part of it. So thank you, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be your mistress of ceremonies. Um, of course, thank you. I'm coming off of a few days of a conference on women in leadership, and it is just so appropriate. And you know what I recognize is that some, you know, women in leadership we share some commonalities. Some of our situations are a little bit different than others, but bottom line is we're here because we're dedicated to this work and we're dedicated to the people that we serve. And it is indeed a service that that we're that we're doing, and it's an honor. It's an honor to serve. So thank you, thank you again for having me. Uh, the museum here are, is a repository of artifacts that will share our history and serve as a record of the dreams, the vision, and courage of our ancestors. It's not just a museum to share our history, but a place for people, for people to connect and to feel their deeper sense of humanity. So it's an honor today. At this time, I'd like to invite Reverend Alice Hutchins to the podium to deliver the invocation. I had such a busy weekend this week and this weekend and this kink in this leg just won't let me go. <laughs> but I praise God that I'm a little bit better. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, dear God. We thank you, dear God, for bringing us this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. 
Dear God, we just thank you for though that our hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. Dare not trust the sweetest friend, we're going to wholly lean on your name. And we say, on Christ the solid rock we stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. Dear God, we thank you today for this dedication. Dear God, we think of all the four uh, runners that have helped us to get this far by faith, dear God. Dear God, we just thank you, dear God, for each and every one who's sem assembled here today. Dear God, give them what they need, dear God, if they're going through something, dear God, sickness or anything that they need, God, you got it. And we ask you to continue to bless this program in a special way. Thank you, dear God, for the leaders of the Ken Nutter Alumni Association. Thank you, dear God, for the teachers that we had. Thank you, God, for the teachers that are here today that have brought us this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. Dear God, we thank you, and we give all praise and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Please stand and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Fine. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to recognize any elected official who took time out of their busy schedules to be with us today, whether you are currently uh, in office or formerly in office. I ask you if you would please stand. Um, it's our hope that um, this museum will help all of the members of our community. Without our elected officials, certainly we would not have this opportunity to be here today. So. Um, I'd like to recognize Mr. Mark Anderson. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for being here with us today. And I know that there are several others who may be on their way. Uh, there are a lot of things happening in Queen Anne's County today. There's the Kent Island Day, and, and I know that there are several who are there. So, uh, Mr. Washington, if there are any others, I don't want to um, omit anyone. Well, I, I want to give kind of a special, I think it's coming up next anyhow, the teachers and the uh, students. Okay, yes. I'll leave it up to you. Then. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> so at this time, we'll recognize former staff and students. So Ms. Kennard's accomplishments are notable, Ms. Lucretia Kennard. She had a vision of change. And today, as we dedicate this building, we would be remiss not to recognize our former staff and students, <coughs> graduates of Kennard High School. Former staff, if you would please stand so that we may recognize you. And former students, please stand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kenard High School has produce doctors, lawyers, educators, entrepreneurs, and productive citizens in our county. Queen Anne's County is a better place because of Kennard's teachers and students. So we thank you, and we thank you for being here. The history of Kennard. Kennard has been an iconic symbol of African American history in our community since 1935. At this time, we'll have Ms. Janet Pauls to please come forward to share the history of the building. And um, as we proceed with the dedication, it's important for everyone to understand how this historic day in this building started. So, Ms. Paul. I'm bringing Mr. Annie O'Newkeberry. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I have the distinct pleasure of providing just a little bit of history about Kennard. We, it's so rich, so this will just be an overview. The history of Kennard begins well before there was a school named Kennard. In fact, there would not have been a Kennard school if a dedicated educator from Philadelphia named Lucretia Kennard had not come to the Eastern Shore in 1903. In those days, schools were segregated by race and black schools, if they even existed, were poorly funded. It was hard to get teachers because the pay was as low as $25 a year. 
Each one year school had about 25 or 30 students, grades one through seven. Black students used old textbooks after the white schools had discarded them. And there were never enough books or supplies. Furthermore, there was no such thing as a high school, a comprehensive high school for black students. And as you tour the museum today, you will see all of the schools that we had in each of the communities, each of the uh, first black schools. So please take the time to tour the museum so you will see them. Some are still standing. There was no transportation either. Some students walked up to five miles to get to school, no matter what the weather was. We know some of those students were responsible for lighting the fires and making sure that there was heat for the other students and the teachers when they arrived. Lucretia Kennard, who knew what a good education meant, must have been discouraged when she arrived on the Eastern Shore in 1903. But she must have seen tremendous opportunities, too. By 1929, she was the supervisor of colored schools, the first in Queen Anne's County. She recruited teachers, developed curricula, and set very high goals for her students. And perhaps most importantly, she encouraged and inspired community <coughs> support for her schools. Every black school in Queen Anne's County had an active PTA. There was, in the 1920s, a school called Centerville Colored Industrial High School, <coughs> but it wasn't really a high school, not like the white students had. Black students needed a real high school, a comprehensive high school. Lucretia Kennard Daniels, because she had married during that time, worked with local black citizens to raise money to purchase the property for such a high school. This is the building that is in front of you, minus the second edition, the second floor. Unfortunately, she died in 1933 before the school was constructed. In 1936, Centerville High School for Black, uh, Centerville High School for Black Students was ready to open, and it was named Kennard High School. In her honor, and a lot of people think this is the high school. It was not the first high school. This was the original high school. Because there was no bus transportation, many of the black students had to live in boarding houses in Centerville rather than in their own homes. In the early 1950s, before all schools in the United States were racially integrated, Maryland established separate but equal schools, and the first portion of the new high school was constructed. But as often the case, the schools were not really equal. There was initially no cafeteria in the new school, and student meals were prepared in the home economics room. So after 1951, 1951 was the last class to graduate from the wooden structure here, and we moved here, and this was Kennard High School, we still had no cafeteria. So even though schools were equal, we still did not have the same um, resources that the white schools had. The first graduating class of 1936, there were 20 students, 10 females and 10 males. And the last graduating class in this wooden building had 28 students, 14 females and 12. One of those was my mother. And she was in that last graduating class. And prior to that class graduating there, the students only attended grade uh, one to 11. And then after that, she was the first graduating class in grade 12. She has many fond memories that she shared with us as we grew up about um, the school, especially the Follies. Yes. <laughs> so we're enlisting support right now because next uh, year for Black History Month, we're bringing the Follies back. So get ready. Yes. So the last graduating class, um, which was this building here in 1966, they had 68 students, so you see the grades that the students that graduated progressively got larger. So that's the type of influence that Kennard High School had on our community. So uh, that's just a brief history of the building. Please make sure you take the time to tour because there's much more building inside. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Falls. Learn thank something you. every time. So at this time, we're going to have reflections. Uh, we'll have reflections from a former student graduating class of 1947. She went on to become a teacher and taught at Kennard as well as the first teacher of the year for Queen Anne's County 
and Ms. Marcella Bordley's reflections will be shared by her sister, Ms. Deborah Brown. Please come forward. Good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry. Good morning. <laughs> Okay, I'm standing in for Marcella this morning. She was supposed to be here this morning, but she called me at quarter to seven this morning. She said, I'm not feeling well. So I said, you know, I'll still go on and read the paper that you prepared. So this is coming from her. When Deborah told me that Clayton wanted me to report on some of my days at Kennard High, my first thought was, how can he think that I can remember what happened 72 years ago, <laughs> when I can hardly now remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> Some of us entered high school at the age of 11 and 12 and graduated at the age of 15 and 16 because someone allowed us to enter elementary school when we were four and five years old. In the beautiful autumn of September 1943, 53 students made our entrance into the Kennard High School. Our teachers were Mr. Jones, principal, Ms. Hardy, Ms. Johnson, Ms. Wyatt, and Mr. Brown. Our junior year, with many talents, quite a few members appeared in the first annual Follies. In my senior year, I remember making my first dress in home ec and never did get the collar exactly right, but I wore it anyway. <laughs> the day of our final exam in Ms. Hardy's class, she made the announcement, if any of you think that you do not have to take my exam, you may now walk out. <laughs> Kenneth Kennedy and Dolores Borley walked out. <laughs> At the end of the exam, she said to me, you could have walked out also. <laughs> our class published the school's first yearbook. 16 students held on until the end. They were Kenneth Kennedy, John Carter, Dolores Bordley Handy, Mary Willer, Ray Green, Geraldine Stansberry, Christine Shercliff Roy, John Hadrick, Joseph Green, Ralph Dye, Ruth Stanford, Robert Bailey, Arlington Wright, Marcella Handy Bordley, Myrtle Martin, and Lorraine Hill Anderson. Graduation was held at Charles Wesley Church here in Centerville. After the completion of a new Kennard High School, the old school became Kennard Elementary School. In 1951, I graduated from Boys State College with a BS degree in elementary education. My first teaching position was for 13 years in Pocomoke City, Maryland. Guess what? I returned to Queen Anne's County in 1964 and taught first grade for three years in the school that was once my high school. Marcella Handy Boy. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. The renovation project. On September 12, 2000, Vivian Goldsboro and Madeline Hollis made, uh, met with Congressman Wayne Gilchrist, Tony Caligiuri, and Press Secretary for Gilchrist. The Karen and Karen Trinkley, Administrator of the Historic Sites Consortium for, Ant for Queen Anne's County, to discuss plans to restore Kennard into a cultural arts center. On October 2006, about 40 citizens participated in the cleanup at Kennard High School. Vivian Goldsboro and Janet Pauls organized the cleanup on a beautiful fall day. The volunteers included graduates from the school and community members. The group removed trash and furniture and boarded up the windows. This began the first phase of the school's refurbishment. A few small grants were written and donations from the community supported the first phase. At this time, we're going to ask if Mr. Clayton Washington will explain phases two and three of the project. And following Mr. Washington, we'll hear from Mr. O, Andrew Anukaberry, 
I hope I pronounced that correctly. All right. Retired design and construction director for Queen Anne's County Public Schools, who was instrumental in getting the renovation project started. Mr. O was, a skill, was skilled in renovation projects and worked tirelessly with the Cunard Alumni Association without compensation. So he essentially, like everybody else, was a volunteer in this work, driven by the heart. So at this time, Mr. Washington, please come forward. Once again, welcome to those who have come in since I think the first time. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, after the initial uh, cleanup and the, uh, the way to stabilize the building in some way, uh, we embarked in 2007 uh, on the journey to fulfill the dream of restoring our old high school, to create an African-American uh, cultural heritage center and museum. So we used a small grant from Preservation Maryland to develop the use plans and a formal estimate for the building's restoration. This estimate projected a con construction cost of $1.5 million. Now, though through a lot of grassroots funding, donors and donations, the association had managed to build a restoration fund of over $60,000, well short of what we needed. We quickly realized that we should take a united and committed effort uh, to, to reach our goals. We soon understand that, that this project had three sides, funding and financing, construction planning and implementation, and program building use and vision. I'm gonna talk about those three things, uh, maybe a little bit out of order. But first of all, we needed money, <laughs> to put it very succinctly. Um, our first grant that we wrote as a major grant for the restoration of buildings was done with the Maryland Heritage Areas Authority. And there's a young lady named Elizabeth Watson. She's not here today. But she got, walk, held my hand and walked me through filling out this first grant that will become the template for anything we did later in, in the future. Little did I know at the time, it was so significant, and it allowed me to write the other grants. And to, uh, but she's not here today, but I wanted to recognize her because she held my hand through that entire process. Uh, the next phase was to go to the Queen Anne's County Commissioners. Mark's here. Uh, and I talked to a young man named John Borders. He was then our county administrator. And I told him of our efforts and our dreams to, to restore this building. And I asked him for a lot of money, is what it boiled down to. He kind of smiled at me and said, you must be kidding. <laughs> but I said, no. But he and the county commissioners at that time one of those is sitting in the front row also, Mr. Courtney Billups, decided we were worth taking a gamble on. And at that point, they helped us provide the matching funds for that uh, Maryland State Grant. And we got started. I want to also recognize all commissioners from 2006 through 2014, because all along the way, they provided funding to help restore this building. So I want to thank them once again. Uh, there's only a couple of them here today, but they're all in our hearts, believe me. We next undertook, undertook for financing what's called a bond bill. I don't, Linda here today? Linda Walls? She's not here today, but again, hand-holding time. Hand-holding time. Uh, Linda helped instruct me on what we had to do to get the state to draft a bond bill that was so we could get funding for this project. Uh, and I want to thank, even though they're not here, our senators and our delegates, even one that wasn't in our district, uh, Senator now Addie Eckert from District 37. They wrote bills that allowed us to get funding for this project. And we got bond bill funding, I think, three times. And each time we went over and had to speak to the uh, senators and the delegates and to convince them in order to, to fund our project. And there were people right sitting in this room that went with me and held my hand and, and said, go get them. We had three minutes to explain how we wanted that funding to work. And lo and behold, and I, I, I'm, a, I'm a man of faith. So I know somebody was up there rooting for us. And at that point, 
uh, we were able to get funding in the neighborhood of $600,000 for this project from state. Then next came the African American History Preservation Program grant. There's a group called the Maryland Commission on <coughs> African American History and Culture that makes recommendations of projects that are deserving of this grant. Um, and they recommended us three years in a row to get a grant that amounted by $300,000 towards the restoration of the building. Uh, there's a young lady named Ann Rain. She's not here today either. But again, hand-holding time. She held my hand through this process to make sure we all dotted our eyes and crossed our teeth and dotted our eyes on this project. And we were able to um, fulfill our financial obligations in terms of making sure the money was spent wisely. All who donated, and then what I want to thank all who donated, attended, and supported our fundraising efforts. Our 5K that we used to have here. Our gala that we now have every year. Our fish fries. Well, we used to love fish dinners to make this work. Our capital campaign fundraising initiatives. Uh, all of you were just as important as any grant that we got. Because without your help, we wouldn't have been able to match the obligations that allowed us to write and get the other grants. So I want to thank all of you. Give yourselves a hand. So that's how the funding uh, occurred for this project. Uh, next, instead of talking about construction right now, I want to talk about our vision. Uh, because as, as a, as a, unless we have a vision, it says the people perish. Okay? And at that point, I, I know that we had to determine what we were going to use this for and how it was going to be used. And we wanted to make sure that we honored uh, those whose backs we were standing on to have this build, building in use again. Uh, so we, before we could begin the construction, we need to be, to, there needed to be a vision, which, would, which we decided would, one, promote educational and cultural enrichment fostered by our African American roots in family and community. Two, we wanted to tell the story of African American history here in Queen Anne's County and nationwide as it related to the high school's formation, existence, and growth here in the county. And three, we want we wanted to fulfill a need to provide a resource for the community to col to collectively communicate, socialize, and recreate here in Queen Anne's County. We believe this has been and is being accomplished by the restoration and creation of the Kennard African American Cultural Heritage Center and Museum. Now, again, there was some along the way that helped us with this vision. Uh, and one of them is sitting in the front row today. One of the things we wanted to do in the vision of the museum and telling our story was to let the people who lived it tell the story. And to help us do that, Karen Somerville, raise your hand, say hello, uh, facilitated, I think, up to 20 or 25 recorded histories that we now have in the can from people who went to the school or, or, or lived in the county, who worked in the county, to tell our story. And now kids, people that come to this building will be able to see that firsthand and hear it out of their mouths. And that's something we know that we lose as time goes on. So we were fortunate to have that done. Uh, we were blessed when we started the museum project to put together a committee of historians and uh, people who were aware of our struggles to come together to form a committee to put, put together our African American History Museum. So I want to thank all of them. I'm not sure any, any of them are here. Ms. Hollis started out with us. Deborah started out with us on the committee. Uh, we were blessed to get a museum curator named Robert Forlone. He's not here today. He had to go to Mexico. But Robert uh, was the curator for the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum in um, St. Michael's. He's also a curation professor at multiple colleges adjunct. And, uh, he came on board and he, found, he realized that this was something that uh, needed to be done. And he helped, again, a little hand-holding and walking us through. Our county historian, she's not here today either, Mary Margaret Revelle Goodwin, who many of you know, uh, has done extensive research on African-American history uh, here and nationwide. And she was the provider of a lot of the content for our museum. So we want to thank those people also, even in the adventure. They're not here today, but I want you to give them a hand anyhow. 
Now, finally, the restoration construction. I've learned more about construction during this process than I ever, than I ever wanted to. <laughs> and there's been a lot of hand-holding. I've always talked about that and learning as we go. First, there were the was the architects and contractor selection process. We had an expert in instruction and advisement to help us through that process. Once the contractor was selected, we began phase one, or phase two, really, in 2010, uh, the exterior and structural restoration. Walls, windows, foundation uh, were all restored or replaced. We never know the extent of a building's damage until you start to tear it apart. There were significant structural challenges, which added about $200,000 to the original estimate. Windows, if you look over there, you see those large windows had to be completely restored. And every window in this building was taken out, taken off site, uh, cleaned, restored, panes fixed. Uh, we had a, what's called an historic easement on this building which doesn't allow us to change a lot of things, but to continue to make it look and act exi exactly as it was originally. So that process, we wanted to replace every window in this building with more, uh, windows that, that, that provided uh, better heat and, uh, and cooling efficiency. But the trust said, no, you can't do that. So at that point, we, we restored all the windows. Again, at a, a cost. Uh, at a cost, significant cost, which added about $100,000 to the original estimate. Mm -hmm. New singles, laymen, uh, all the plumbing and electrical and mechanical reference were done on, on that phase. Uh, new joists in the floors and new subfloors and exterior doors were, were, were restored and, and, and uh, replaced. We continue to have an expert instruction advice of the person God sent to us. In 2013, we began the final phase. By the end of 20, uh, we ended the final phase, the first phase. Uh, we had run out of money. So we knew this was going to happen. So we had to go out and try to get fu more funding to, to, to complete the restoration. And that took the first phase, the second phase, I keep calling it the first phase. It was the first phase of the construction. But the second phase of the restoration uh, ended up costing about $900,000. By 2015, we had raised enough money through grants and donations and a small loan. We did have to borrow some money. By the way, you're welcome to help pay that back. <laughs> <laughs> we had to borrow $150,000 to complete the project. And people have already pledged to help, re help pay that funding back. <coughs> the final phase, okay, which started in 2015, was all the interior work. Okay, the new drywall, the wainscot restoration. There are some significant things in this building that weren't changed, they were just restored. Um, plumbing completion, interior doors were all restored. By the way, every one of those doors are the original doors that were in this building, all the interior doors. Again, taken off site, uh, restored, and then returned. The only new things are the lighting in this building. When we got here, because it was in such disrepair, we really didn't know what the original lighting looked like. So we chose what's called period lighting to complete the lighting process. And these were, li these were lights that would have been used in school buildings and during our time. Uh, the floors. The floors in this building, and those of you who came and did the, um, uh, the original demolition, uh, you, under, you understand this because those floors probably had three or four layers of, of, of linoleum over top of them. The original floors we, we uh, surmised were pine because that's what was used in schools in those days. Pine, as you know, is a very soft wood. So when the constructor, when the contractor brought in the samples of the flooring, you could scratch it with your fingernail. And we said, this won't work. And we had a budget for, for flooring in, in the contract. Uh, of about 275 per square foot. We went back to the state and said, can we replace that with the new, all this new flooring that you can buy today, the hardwood flooring? And they said, no, it's got to be pine flooring. Okay. Well, what's called hard pine or hard flooring costs about 875 a square foot. 
which is a little bit out of our budget. But the contractor did find something called uh, Douglas fir pine. And if you've been inside and you've seen those floors, they turned out beautifully. Uh, and it's, a, it's not as hard as hard pine, but it's not as soft as regular pine either. So it worked out well for us. And thanks again to Queen Anne's County and to that expert I keep talking about for help. And that guy I've been mentioning, which brings us here today, the expert advice and instruction and help I referred to was provided by Mr. Andrew Anakaberry. <laughs> or Andy O, as we know him. Who, without his help, this restoration would not have been completed. Uh, that's how important he was to us. So at that point, he was a, certainly a godsend. Uh, my friend and our construction and my construction mentor, Mr. Andy O. I have to say something. You have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Um, my name is Andrew on the Kubi, but they call me Andy O. Um, first of all, is there anybody here who went to this school? Wow! Look at them, look at them. Some elementary lesson. Yeah, you went to this school, yeah? <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about me, if you don't mind. Um, I immigrated from Nigeria 43 years ago. And I went to school in Nigeria, a prep school that's supposed to be top of the line. You have to take entrance to go to those schools. It's a boarding school. And it was run by a seven-day Adventist. And it's supposed to be there in this school. I graduated, got a scholarship to go to UCLA. But the thing was, in that school, we did not have any electricity. We did not have any water. We all, so no air conditioning. So we thought we were doing very well. Then that brings me to here. When I was hired, I'm an architect. And when I was hired by Joseph Olock to come and uh, help with renovations of Queen Anne County, I was doing very well. And um, then it came to the turn to renovate Kennard, this good here. Most of you can know the bus used to go around here. Yeah. So I played a major role in the re redoing this canal here. <coughs> But I've discovered a lot of secrets on the file. This school was built with infrastructural foundation for second floor. You may not know that. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna do a two-story building, you can't just do a two-story building on this, on, this, on this building. You have to get those infrastructure right. Mm -hmm. Then I found some documents where it was said that when they African American population grows up, we're going to keep them right here by putting the second floor. That was the plan. Well, integration had changed it. So, in doing this, then comes into my office, Mr. John Wright. And I never paid attention to what's going on here. And John came and spoke to me when I was discussing about what was going on here, and then he started telling me about the stories about this building. Then he called Mr. Charles Nesbitt, and they told me, let's go and look at this building here and see what I'm talking about. So I walked through this door, and first of all, the <coughs> roof was wide open. It'd been left abandoned all these years. Water has come in, you can look through, and make sure you don't fall through there. So John says, Andy, and then they were having a meeting, and then John and recruited them, this extraordinary Jennifer, to talk to me about assisting with the renovation of this building. They said, we want your expertise. We want to do this, but we don't know what to do. Help us to guide us. But the, the good news is, when they told me stories about this building, I don't cry in public, but I was inspired. Now, 
When I was renovating this building here, this, the square footage for this classroom is 650 square feet, okay? It's not large enough for us. When I did Marapik, it grew to 850. When we do Solisville, 870. Then he told me about the classroom here with the teacher. I don't know who, who, who she is now. Miss Alice. Miss Alice. She told me the story where she would put the kids in the classroom and there was not, not enough room for her. Then she had to stand in the hallway to teach. And I'm complaining about my high school. <laughs> well, this was, if anybody could go through that school, that is inspiring. I told John, we need to bring even my own kids to come here and listen to this story. That is being inspired on what you want to do. As, a, as an architect, give us a problem, we try to solve it. This, then John said, well, help me out, brother. <laughs> no, my accent is not making justice to it. John, how do you say it? You said great, bro. I did? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but your accent was a little bit better. Help me out, brother. That, that was good. It has some spice into it. <laughs> and I told John, first of all, let's close up here. You're going to need money. You're going to need a lot of people. You're going to need some commitment. If you can do the roof, let's do the asbestos. Do all those things. At least seal the place up. Then we can go do it. Surprising for me, they performed it. You see, you tell people, let's do something. Sometimes people just say, they, all they do is talk. They don't do the work. <laughs> Canal alumni was ready to do the work. Yeah. And let me tell you, that kind of inspired me too. So I was hesitant, but your idea that you want to see this through inspired me to do what I have to do. So in beginning, it's, it's, like he said, it's navigating the process. To do a school, as it takes us one year to do design and two years to do construction. This process started for me in 2006. It's going 13 years now. So saying that you will do it, that was good. They invited me to the meeting. We just used to have a meeting somewhere there. Janet called me and I came down and I spoke to you. But anybody here who attended those Saturday meetings and made decisions, you need a hand of applause. Because you, you, are, you are behind the scenes doing it. And you can do, say what you say about doing any project but money is the lifeblood of any project. And that comes in, they introduced me to Mr. Clay Washington. Yeah. Yeah. It was not an easy process. Yes. And we, I won't bore you details about what we went through. It was not easy. But, but navigating through things is difficult. Um, I remember almost cost me my job, but I, I was too valuable for it. I never shared this to John, but um, no, somebody reported me that um, I was using my office resources to help Canada Alumni Association. I was calling, I told them, well, either I continue the help or I'm working out. But, and I, like I said, I didn't want to say this because he would have started a lot of problems. But I think what happened was that was why part of the um, free bid meeting we have to move it to Graysonville. Um, that's Graysonville um, Community Center. Community Center. Yeah. Yeah. Community Center. Yeah. Yeah. That was why. And then I, I asked my friends, architects, for professional policy to help us out. We came here. We took measurements, did all the things. I had ideas. I designed what I thought was great. Went to Maryland History Trust. They knocked some of my things, uh, my uh, my designs down. The place he showed me was the principal's office. I, th I wanted to do toilet over there, but that was the principal's office. That tiny little room there. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, do you can you imagine what the principal tells me about the office? Then another story about 
this building here was this, um, the, the 1946 addition, the basement was their gymnasium. <laughs> rainy day space. Yeah, rainy day gymnasium. That was only 400 square feet. <laughs> the gym we have now, the standard is 3,500. <laughs> and uh, when you rainy day, they play over there. Yep. So, so, you know, you know, <laughs> I, all these things are inspiring stories that this must be done. And I appreciate, no, you gave me the opportunity. I'm so grateful that God brought me to Queen Anne County. Uh, and run into these extraordinary people. And you gave me the opportunity to do a project. Regardless of what I've done for Queen Anne County, you've seen all my schools, Kenaland, Kennard, all of them, uh, Southernsville, Marapik, all, all of them. They all won award, but I consider this one of my best projects. Yeah. I think I also would like to thank all of you, honestly, for restoring this. I think I have some visitors there. there um, I'm, I'm sorry for being late. There's an accident on Route 50 right. by um, Thompson, so I got caught on that. And I have some visitors who are coming. They're on their way here. They come from California. They heard the story about this story here. They're on their way. They'll be coming here to come and see the school themselves. They come from San Diego and New York. And they were going to sit here because I will come to tell anybody about the story about this project. Honestly, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to serve you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. O and Mr. Washington. Thank you so much. Let's give them another round. Of applause. And we commend all of the design and construction professionals who've overseen the refurbishment of this historic landmark. Thank you. And now for the unveiling of donors. <coughs> Excuse me. The refurbishment of this building would not have been possible without the generous philanthropic contributions of many, many people. The Kennard Alumni Association is grateful for your generous support your depths of gratitude for helping us reach our goal is etched in the plaques that we will unveil. Mr. Washington, alumni members, will you now unveil the plaques? Uh, any uh, of the board members want to come forward? Any of this? And while they're coming forward, uh, a couple people have come in since we started, and I want to recognize them. Uh, again, Mr. Courtney Billups, one of our former commissioners, that uh, said okay to this project, Ms. Carol Fadansky, also. I'm done looking around, make sure I, I don't miss anybody. And something else I'd like to say, uh, there are some of our former teachers here that inspired us to be who we are today. Yeah. Um, there is, I, I still gotta call it Miss Kennedy, I can't help it. <laughs> Mr. Nesbitt, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And where is she? She's not going to get up? No. All right. Yeah. Miss Hollis. Oh. Yeah. 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 Miss Hollis was kind of an inspiration. And I remember when we first came here to start this project, she said to me, Coy, don't you leave us in the middle of this. <laughs> And I, and I heeded her words. <laughs> Believe me, they inspired me to push through this and make it happen. I tell her story every time I take somebody through this building of what she had to endure in teaching in a small classroom in a little school. So you all have been inspiration to us. All of our former teachers. Thank you very much. Thank you. So unveil two plaques that represent all of the plaques that will be put up on our Kennard Donor Wall of Fame. But these two will represent those plaques. And we're so thankful to all of you as donors. The names on this plaque represent those people who donated in terms of grants or private funding, any way that they participated. And it doesn't 
explicitly name every person. We had to have some limits or we'd have a wall full of names. But I want you to know that every name, no matter what you gave, it was, if it was a dollar, it was important to this project. So we'll honor you in some way on that wall of fame. If your name is now on this plaque, believe me, your, your names are in our hearts. And they will be on that wall. We thank you all very much. These plaques will be on display inside so you can take a look at them, along with the other two. Okay. So we'll begin with the dedication ritual then. Can I get a program up here? You just say, no, we, ahead, no. you just say we dedicate this program. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's the teacher in her. <laughs> okay. So, today, then, as we dedicate the Kennard African American Heritage Center, we celebrate and look forward to watching all the great things unfold through the walls of this historic building. We'll now recite the dedication ritual found in your program. And we certainly do invite you to join us in this celebratory ceremony. Please refer to the words that are in your program. I'll give you a second to grab them. If you don't have one, just hold up your hand. We'll get you one. To the educational leaders and county officials who labored faithfully and purposefully that the youth of our community might be served. We to the community and all helpers of the committee and community whose loyal, patient, and responsible care we entrust the education of our community. We dedicate this building to the future of our community, which can be realized and assured only through the education and opportunities we make available to coming generations. We dedicate this building. To the future of our community and state, which will be served by those who pass through this museum. We dedicate this to the education of our community that they may know and appreciate and perpetuate the heritage which is theirs. We dedicate this building. And in dedicating this building, we dedicate also ourselves to provide not only the means but more specifically the example which will make this building real, meaningful, and educational to all. Thank you. And for the ribbon cutting. The ribbon cutting is a symbolic part of the program today. It represents the official opening of the museum to the public. Everyone on the podium, as well as those that are standing, uh, we'll get ready to cut the ribbon. So for those who are going to come forward, please come forward. Put your hands on. Uh, Brother Mark, Brother Courtney, come forward, please. Uh, they're significant. And Sister Carol. So we asked um, Miss Cecilia Shorter to kind of hold the scissors here along with Brother Clayton. Because Miss Cecilia actually started this program, working in this program, far before any of us became involved. She yes. served as president of the uh, mm -hmm. association, and she yeah. certainly deserves that honor. Thank you. Mark, you guys need to move over there. Come over, guys. Yep, so come on over. Huh? On the other side of it, we can get the picture. All right, hold on one second. We're going to get another shot. Yeah. Be careful. Come on in. Dr. King, you two need to move over there. Right next to Alice. That's good. All right. We got everybody? Look up. Hold those scissors out. Thank you. In closing, we thank each and everyone who came out to celebrate this historic occasion. After 84 years, it's been a long, long time coming. Amen. And it's a perfect tribute to Miss Kennard, a Queen Anne's County history maker and the Kennard Alumni Association for appreciating the past and projecting hope for the future. 
This has been a formal but joyous occasion on which I'm proud to be a part. I certainly can say that. I join my other colleagues here on the stage and, and, uh, and reminisce on you know, what this really means. And it is a celebration of our folks. It's a celebration of those who began here. It's a celebration of Ms. Kennard. It's a celebration of our recognition of the past. But it's also recognition for what's to come. It's the hope that this building will be used uh, for all that it's intended to be used for. I've used this word before. I'd like to leave you with this one. This is a, it's an African word, it's Ubuntu. And as we talk about our history, um, as we talk about what has happened and we project to the future, we'll keep in mind that word. Ubuntu means I am because we are. It recognizes the community that we share. It recognizes that we're connected by our purpose. We're connected by the love that we have for one another. We're connected by our hope for the future. So as we go on and we tour our building and, and we celebrate our community, let us keep that in mind because we are because of each of us. And that is our connection. That's what we'll continue to share with our children about how important our history is, but how important it is that we project hope to the future and that we stay connected. So thank you again for having me. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to serve as the MC today. And we're going to end with a benediction. So I'm going to ask that Mr. or, or Reverend Clay, uh, Clarence Wayman, <laughs> pastor of Bryan's and John Wesley United Methodist Church, deliver the benediction. OK, thank you very much. And after the benediction, uh, refreshments will be served inside, so please do stay and join us. Let us stand, those that can. May the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior continue to guide us to our future hope May the love of God and the joy of the Holy Spirit continue to empower us to do God's will. And God, may the joy of living a life for you continue to uplift our hearts, draw us closer together, and move as a family into your purpose for our lives. Watch over us, rule with us. In Jesus' name we offer this benediction. Amen. Amen. Amen.